Just because a drug or drug class is called inhibitor or has the prefix anti, it doesn't necessarily mean that it acts as an antagonist in the way that we've been studying so far. That is especially true if that drug is an indirect acting drug. <laughs> As you'll recall from the introductory handout, indirect acting drugs are those that do not act by binding a receptor, whereas direct acting drugs are those that do act by binding a receptor. When we talk about drugs affecting chemical messengers like neurotransmitters, as in the cases I'm going to talk about today, the indirect acting drugs increase or decrease the total amount of the natural ligand. That is, these drugs act by increasing or decreasing the total amount of norepinephrine in the case of monoamine oxidase inhibitors or acetylcholine with anticholinesterases. Let's start out with norepinephrine, the neurotransmitter responsible for the sympathetic nervous system's actions, and think about the way norepinephrine is normally manufactured, released, and regulated in nerve endings. Now this is a diagram you'll find in your handout. Don't worry about all the details here. Let's just think about the processes. So what happens is tyrosine is converted to dopa, which is then converted to dopamine. You'll remember dopamine is its own neurotransmitter, but if you use it IV, it binds beta-1 receptors in the heart. So dopa turns to dopamine, which is then converted to norepinephrine, which is then transferred into vesicles. The vesicles sit around inside the cell, and then they are released, in which point they have the opportunity to bind receptors, bounce off, bind, bounce off, bind, bounce off. Every time the norepinephrine binds, you get a little yay. Um, and then at some point, the norepinephrine either diffuses away or it gets broken down by enzymes that are sitting on the target cell, like COMT. Uh, sometimes the norepinephrine gets re-uptaked, as we say. They get, it gets sucked back up and reused. Um, and back inside the cell, it also can be broken down by an enzyme called monoamine oxidase. simplify this image a little bit. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors are indirect acting drugs that do what they say they do. They are monoamine oxidase inhibitors. If that enzyme cannot break down norepinephrine, because we gave the MAOI, the norepinephrine concentrations rise, and in the autonomic nervous system, this leads to increased synthetic tone. If we know this, we can predict what sort of symptoms you would theoretically see in a patient on monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So we would see the actions of norepinephrine. So we would see symptoms related to alpha-1 and beta-1 receptors. So the sympathetic effects you might see would be all the alpha-1 things, like dilated pupils, which would make the patient have blurred vision, dry mouth because of reduced GI secretions, reduced urine flow, constipation, Right? And then beta-1 things, it would cause tachycardia. Uh, and then, of course, all autonomic drugs cause sexual dysfunction, possibly. When we talk about CNS in the future, we'll know that side effects of norepinephrine in the brain include a loss of appetite and difficulty sleeping. So the monoamine oxidase inhibitors are acting like sympathetic agonists. Let me say that again. Right? The, um, the MAO inhibitor is acting as if we gave the patient a direct acting sympathetic agonist because we're stimulating and we're simulating the same uh, actions as norepinephrine. We started out by talking about receptors and agonists and antagonists and those words really should only be specific to drugs that bind receptors but people just refer to agonists and antagonists by the clinical outcomes of giving the patient the drug because that's the most clinically useful thing to know uh, is to know does this drug act like an agonist or, or an antagonist when we look at the patient's symptoms not necessarily what's happening at the molecular level. So I hear you saying, whoa, wait a minute, MAO, in, MAO eyes, that's MAO inhibitor. How can an inhibitor be an agonist? So the, the fact that it's inhibiting the enzyme that breaks down norepinephrine means that norepinephrine 
levels rise. Okay, make sure you got that down. Okay, so when you're talking about indirect acting drugs, the word agonist and antagonist refer to whether or not that drug acts like an agonist or an antagonist if it were direct acting. Okay, a little bit confusing. Now, we are going to talk more about MAOIs in the CNS unit, but before I move on to the second drug class I want to talk about, I'd like to point out one other pharmacologic item of interest about MAOIs, like tranylcypermine. This drug binds covalently. So the drug binds the enzyme, not the receptor, right, because it's indirect acting. This drug actually binds the enzyme covalently and irreversibly. So this drug screws up MAOI forever because it's a chemical bond. And this becomes very important because if you stop the drug because you want to switch the patient to a different drug or for whatever reason, you have to wait for your body to make more MAO before you can add another drug. And we'll talk more about that in the CNS. But uh, it's an irreversibly acting drug, but it's okay. Your body can live without MAOs uh, for a while. And in fact, if you're depressed, that can actually make your depression treated. So we'll talk about it later. All right, now the second indirect acting drug class I want to talk about affects not norepinephrine, but acetylcholine. So now we're talking about affecting the parasympathetic nervous system. In this diagram, you see that our friend acetylcholine is broken down by an enzyme which metabolizes or breaks down acetylcholine into acetate and choline. So it definitely deactivates acetylcholine. It breaks it into two pieces. Okay, So this enzyme is classically abbreviated ACHE, which stands for acetylcholinesterase. So, you know, just like in a monoamine oxidase, this is acetylcholinesterase. The ASE ends, uh, ending means that it's an enzyme. Now, acetylcholinesterase is present in nerves, in skeletal muscle, right? Because you remember acetylcholine causes skeletal muscle to contract, um, and also in red blood cells. <laughs> the fact that cholinesterase is present in red blood cells makes giving a patient acetylcholine as a injection pretty much impossible because if you give somebody an acetylcholine injection into their IV, the drug is gone because the red blood cells just break it down. So we had to figure out a trickier way of getting acetylcholine to work in a patient's body. We can't just inject it. What we can do is inhibit the enzyme that breaks it down and that gives us system-wide increases in the level of acetylcholine. So now high levels of acetylcholine are present throughout the body. What kind of symptoms and side effects would we expect to see? Well, when acetylcholine binds muscarinic receptors, as in the autonomic nervous system, we're going to see parasympathetic effects. So acetylcholine binds muscarinic receptors, and you'll see things like small pupils, increases in GI secretions and motility, so you'll see drooling and <laughs> diarrhea and cramping. <laughs> Um, you'll also increase and improve urine flow. Uh, but most concerning is that you also will get a drop in the heart rate and a drop in blood pressure. Don't forget, it'll also be hard to breathe because of bronchoconstriction. Uh, and that's what's, you know, the most concerning in terms of emergencies. When you see overwhelming parasympathetic symptoms, that's actually called a cholinergic crisis. It's a term meaning that there's too much acetylcholine. Now, don't forget that acetylcholine also binds acetylcholine receptors in the skeletal muscle, right? So it binds nicotinic receptors there, which is going to cause contraction of the skeletal muscle. And when you get repeated contraction of the skeletal muscle, the muscle actually gets fatigued and won't contract anymore. And not only does that make you fall on the floor, but also it makes it so you can't breathe very well because you need those muscles in your rib cage to help you breathe. Fortunately, doses of normal reversibly binding anticholinesterases are fine. And we use them for a variety of problems, including myasthenia gravis. There are some irreversibly binding anticholinesterases, and that's limited to a few 
very low dose eye drops that are very useful, and poisons. So sarin gas or many organophosphate pesticides that are used by farmers can irreversibly bind. They actually form a covalent bond. It's a phosphate group that's stuck on the cholinesterase and ruins it. So that cholinesterase can't work. Now, you could go with monoamine oxidase inhibitors. They were irreversible. For a while, it was fine. People are on those for years, not a problem. But if you irreversibly destroy the ability of cholinesterase to, to break down acetylcholine, acetylcholine is so important in so many nerves and muscles that that is, not, that is fatal if you get that systemically. All right, so in treating patients with poisoning by those kind of chemicals, you actually have to chemically remove that phosphate group. And you do that with a group of drugs called oxemes. The oxemes, their only job there is to just remove that phosphate group so that the patient can uh, survive being poisoned. Because if you don't do that, then the patient is going to be very sick for a long time until their body makes more cholinesterase. And you can't wait around because it's, it, the patient will die. Here's a critical thinking experiment for you. If a patient was poisoned by organophosphate pesticide, how would you treat them? Well, I told you already you need that oxime to remove that phosphate group. But the patient's going to come in with symptoms of cholinergic crisis. They vomit and poop and urinate and they're drooling and tears are coming out of them. Um, and that's all bad stuff, but also their heart rate is very low and the blood pressure is very low. So you give them the oxime to get that poison off of their cholinesterases. But then you also give atropine to combat the effects of the acetylcholine. Because atropine will compete with acetylcholine for the cholinergic receptors all over the body. And once you get the atropine dose high enough, uh, you can get the acetylcholine activity levels back to something approaching normal. In summary, I've talked about two autonomic, indirect-acting agonist drug classes, both of which have misleading names. Both act by inhibiting an enzyme that breaks down a neurotransmitter. All right, uh, so we're going to revisit norepinephrine and acetylcholine when we cover the CNS, which is our next unit.